welcome to the SNP club. Hands up those who've not been here before. I know you've been. And how many of you responded to the little piece in the National and not? That's interesting to know. Uh, no, no, white rose. Yeah. Make your own. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, good evening everybody and welcome to this event. Now this event is being live streamed, which is why I have this in front of me. So best behaviour everybody. Uh, a couple of announcements. The next event is, was organised for post the 29th and that was to be Ivan McKee talking on the economic impact of Brexit. Well, he's still coming and he's going to be talking about the economic impact of whatever. <laughs> uh, this evening, of course, we welcome John Drummond. And John was the founder of the Scottish uh, Commission on, co on the Constitution. Am I right with... Kenyon Wright. Kenyon Wright and Chris Thompson. And you may think of... Why at this time are we having a talk on the Constitution? What's important about a Constitution? Well, if we look at events and we can't avoid them, south of the border in Westminster, that's the sort of thing that happens when you don't have a written Constitution and the executive kind of makes up the rules as it goes along. And so what we're seeing south of the border is a chronically dysfunctional uh, uh, um, Parliament and of course that's the last thing we want in Scotland and that's why John's here tonight. And I'm going to start John off with a couple of quotes that I found this afternoon about why this uh, a debate and discussion on the Constitution is important. This is a quote from John himself which he's forgotten. It says, if Nicola Sturgeon wants to bring the independence debate onto the high ground, the Constitution is the place to start. And he goes on to say, Scotland lacks constitutional literacy. That's us, I'm afraid. The debate is bitterly partisan, short-sighted, and ill-informed. Well, we're here all this evening to become better informed. So, over to you, John. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Roy, uh, and thank you to all of you for turning out on a wet and windy, is it still as windy out there as it was earlier? Wet and windy Friday. It was a minute ago, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to be talking about the Constitution, as Roy said, and my challenge tonight is to make it interesting. Uh, and, and that's not an easy task, really, because... If you read any books on the Constitution, the first thing that perhaps strikes you is that it all sounds very worthy. You know, you, you, you read it and you think, this is something I really ought to know more about. Anyway, the football's on. <laughs> and it sort of moves on like that. Uh, so my challenge tonight is to make uh, a rather obtuse subject uh, a little bit interesting. But first of all, uh, a bit of background about uh, who I am, and, and Roy has mentioned some of this. Uh, I was the co-founder of the Constitutional Commission with uh, Canon Kenyon Wright. Uh, I was also the co-founder of the Scottish Independence mm -hmm. Convention uh, with a group of people from Oco. Um, and I founded a, a company called Integrity Works, which is the UK's first business Essex consultancy. So, as you can probably gather, I'm well informed about oxymorons, uh, you know, a contradiction in terms. Uh, business ethics is one, perhaps. Uh, I would suggest you military intelligence might be another. <laughs> or airline food. <laughs> uh, and as of three weeks ago, I am now a columnist in, on the Sunday National. And I commend the Sunday National to all of you. If you're not a subscriber or a purchaser, please do so. It's a tremendous newspaper, and not just because I'm a columnist. Uh, 
And, and you won't always see me there. It's in the seven days section. You'll see there's a, a constitutional collar. It's the first of its kind in this country. It is truly unique. And it only took me six months to persuade the editor <laughs> that it's a good idea. Uh, so if any of you want to write in, because it's, it, it takes readers' letters. It encourages readers' inquiries. It's one of the few columns around that says, look, if you write in, we'll try and answer your question. So the question that you will read, if the, my copy has reached the editor in time, uh, on, fr on Sunday, is about uh, the US Constitution and its strengths and weaknesses. And there might be some parallels there uh, in terms of Scotland. Right, that's tonight's theme. Everything you want to know about constitutions, but we're afraid to, to ask. Okay, so I rather hope tonight you won't be afraid to ask. And if you've got questions, stick your hand up. And who knows, I might be able to answer one or two. Uh, but, but feel free. Don't wait until the end if you've got any thoughts or comments. Uh, and we'll try and address those as we go along. Right, agenda. All the best meetings have an agenda. You can't escape from an agenda. And besides, you know, I'm a long-term business consultant, so I'm well used to the basic themes of business consultancy, which are you have to have an agenda, and the folks who attend end up doing most of the work. Uh, and that's pretty much what we're planning to do tonight. Uh, and we're going to try and cover these points uh, roughly, roughly in the order that you, you see them there. There's a, where we are now, because if you're going to deal with any subject, whether it's obtruse or whether it's simple, straightforward, you have to start with where you are. There's an old Irish expression which has a lot of potency, which is that if you don't know where you're going, where you are, you, you don't know where you're going to end up. So you have to start and you have to define where you are. We'll talk a little bit about the basics of a written constitution. And of course, the UK does not have a written constitution. And we'll look at perhaps some of the advantages to Scotland that accrue from living in a state which doesn't have a written constitution. It's not all downside. Uh, how well constitutional matters are understood, Roy has touched upon that. Uh, we did a survey, and I'll talk about that in the way ahead. And maybe some things that you could do as an individual when it comes to these matters. Okay, I said you would end up doing most of the work. Here we go. How many developed countries in the world do not have a written constitution? One, three. No. The majority. Do not. Do not. No. One. How many developed countries expressly permit clerics to make laws? Do you know what I mean by clerics? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, Britain certainly yeah. <laughs> very good point. That, that's very debatable. But it is defined. Okay. Only three countries in the world do not have a written constitution. And they are? The UK. The UK, obviously. New Zealand and Israel. Canada. No, Canada has a written constitution. New Zealand and Israel. New Zealand and Israel. Heaven, somebody's been reading my script. There you are. It was on Twitter earlier today. Was it? <laughs> Gracious. <laughs> there are no secrets in this world. Social media is everywhere. I thought perhaps one, of you, one or two of you read my Sunday uh, national column. All right, right. Only Two developed countries permit clerics to make laws, the UK and? Saudi no. Arabia? <laughs> no. Iran? Iran. 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 Absolutely. <coughs> Iran. So we're in illustrious company here. Uh, and what that means is that people who make the laws are there in a particular chamber of the legislature simply because of their religious uh, persuasion. <coughs> it's a very unusual situation indeed. In fact, most constitutions would not permit such an arrangement because they feel that the church and the state ought to be separate 
the UK takes an entirely different position uh, and encourages uh, the opposite. So, what is a constitution and why does it matter? Why should you care about a constitution? It's a framework for the conduct of the governments <coughs> of the administration. Maybe so, but why should you care? Because it might actually kill you. It might do, in certain circumstances. <coughs> Hopefully extreme. Okay, that's what it is. It's essentially it's a, a system whereby the it's the fundamental law. It's at the apex, this bit, the top bit, of the legal and political systems, which is superior to ordinary acts of parliament. That's important. In other words, it transcends. It's above. It's out of the reach of day-to-day -day politics. That's the point of a constitution. And what does it do? It defines the state. Now remember, it's important, these words are important because I suspect everyone in this room, every single person without exception, wants to create a new state. Am I right in thinking that? Yes. You want a new state. That's your purpose in life. Your aim, your overall goal is to create a new state. And if you, you want, if you define the state, it proclaims the values and the principles. Roy was talking earlier about high moral ground. That's where the high moral ground comes from, on which the state is based. Now, of course, you can have a state which has no values and principles. Of course you can. No, that's not quite, in fairness, that's not quite the case. But nonetheless, you can have such a state. And some states begin this way and fail. They fail. There is no God-given right for a new state to prosper. Now that will sound heresy to many of you because you've always perhaps believed that provided you create the new state, it will be in your image. You probably regard yourself as nice, approachable, personable folks, why would you ever create a state that wasn't like that? Well, it's because it might not be in your gift. It establishes the public institutions and it protects the rights of citizens. This is important because once the UK leaves the EU, Western, Westminster will determine this. Okay? and provides an overarching legal framework for the conduct of politics. That's important, because if that doesn't exist, then the folks who run this, right, will decide what the values and principles are at any moment. Scary. Oh, you think that's scary? <laughs> Wait till we come to the real scary part. <laughs> really, but you're right, it is scary. Okay, in short, a constitution spells out what a country stands for, and what it will not stand for. If you had to reduce a definition of the Constitution, that's what it is. So you don't have to remember a very arcane definition. Just remember one sentence. It's what a country or a state stands for, and what it will not stand for. In other words, the state will not stand for... You, you will eventually decide that. The people in the room will eventually, you will decide that. This is in your gift. You're, you're in a unique moment in history where you will decide what that means for Scotland. Okay. If you want a different way of putting it, this is from Catherine Oddsdotter, who's a member of the Constitutional Council of Iceland. Because you may remember, Icelanders take a very firm view on their approach towards bankers and also on the approach towards constitutions. And uh, they developed their new constitution and she was one of the principal players and she said it's part of being a real independent nation to have your own social contract. Because that's part and parcel of what a constitution is. It's the contract between the state and the citizens. And why would you be a society, you've 
Obviously, her first language isn't English. Why would you be a society or a nation if you can't agree upon your own funda foundation, foundational law? It's common sense. Incidentally, there are more people in Edinburgh than there are in Iceland. So if they can do it, you know, why can't we do it here? OK, I want to... Roy talked about constitutional literacy. And uh, we were lucky enough to be uh, funded by the Scottish Independence Foundation uh, to do a... We commissioned panel base. We designed a, a questionnaire, a survey on constitutional literacy because we wanted to ask people in the UK and in Scotland separately, what do you understand by constitutional matters? Remember I said it earlier, where, where are we now? And obviously, where we want to go, we need to know where we're starting from. And boy, did we get some answers. Heavens above. Uh, I mean, that's almost an oxymoron when it comes to the UK. <laughs> seriously, seriously. There are seven-year-olds in the United States who've forgotten more about constitutions than the Prime Minister. <laughs> Seriously. Seriously. Uh, and we did the field work in November 2018, so it's fairly recent. We interviewed a thousand people in Scotland and 930 in England and Wales. And it was done by panel B, so it's entirely reputable. I mean, they're a good polling company. And if you get around to doing any polling, think about them, because they're good. They're good people to work with. And here are some of the findings. Only 12% of Scots do not want a written constitution. That does not mean, by the way, that the balance did, because a lot of them didn't know what that meant. Only 28% think that the media supports democratic processes in Scotland. That's shocking. That's shocking. Because, because we live in a country without a written constitution, we over-depend upon the other institutions of society speaking truth to power. More than elsewhere, if you don't have a written constitution, you depend on institutions like this. But here in Scotland, only 28% think that they do a job. 35% do not think the Commons supports democratic processes. <laughs> Again, this is, these are the Scottish results. So, you know, it, that's, that's a pretty awful figure. Only 23% think the Lord supports democratic processes. I mean, think about this. The UK constitution, such as it is, depends utterly upon these two entities. That and that for its functioning. To hold the executive to account. You know what I mean by the executive? The, the government. There are very few checks and balances in the UK constitution, I'm afraid. You may have been told otherwise. I'm here to tell you tonight. It ain't so. You're in a very vulnerable position here. Every single person in this room is in an exceptionally vulnerable position for reasons I'm about to delineate. So here we are. These are the two primary props, and look at the ratings. The three and four are dependent on the second one. Yeah. What the third one? Well, not this. largely influenced by the 28% or the, the rest. Possibly, but then again, in other countries, this would not necessarily be the case. So, more survey results. 47% think the Scots Parliament supports democratic processes, but only 23%. Now, I should add, we, this survey produced a wealth of information. I'm only going to touch upon a very, very small, a tiny modicum of the results that we got. If you're interested in the rest of it, and I strongly encourage you to be interested, go to the Scottish Independence Foundation website. It's all there. There's masses of data because we, can, we, can split, we split the data by demographics, by class, by political affiliation, 
by how people voted in referendums and stuff like that. It's all there. There's, uh, I mean, there's so much richness. That, I mean, you know, it would be indigestible if we tried to cover all of it tonight. And besides, we don't have the time. But if you're interested, please go to their site, the Scottish Independence Foundation. It's all there. If you can't find it, let me know. Hi, Kevin. We've got, we got a seat over here if you want to grab one. Uh, and here we are now. This is, this is where life starts to get really interesting. 35% agree that the EU supports democratic processes. In other words, more people think the EU supports democracy than the Commons and the House of Lords. And yet we're just about to leave this lot <laughs> and replace them with... Our, we were utterly dependent upon the Commons and the House of Lords so after do Brexit. Do you not say that 35% do not think that the Commons supports democracy? That's right. That 65% do think that the Commons no. supports No, no, they're, they're neutral. That, that, that's what I said earlier. Don't, what don't, percentage do you think that the Commons it was, it was, most people weren't sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I said be careful about not Assuming the opposite of that is the opposite of this, if you know what I mean. 77% agreed with this statement here. That it should be what a country stands for and what it will not stand for. So that was that description that we looked at earlier. And we wanted to test what people felt the Constitution ought to say. And they agreed with this. 77% agreed with that. These are the Scottish figures, by the way. In addition to what I'm showing you tonight, there's a whole bunch of data dealing with the results from England and Wales. And you might want to take a look at that too, because it's enlightening. There's, we're, we're afloat on a notion of constitutional illiteracy. So when the government says things like, and you've read recently, there's a constitutional crisis, they do not know what they are talking about because they don't know what the word means. So how can you talk about there being a crisis in something you don't know anything about? But that's the reality. And we have journalists who use that terminology. They will say to you, and to you, and to you, we're in a constitutional crisis. And they haven't a clue what it means. They haven't a clue what it means. Now, this is, this is, I'm going to need your help with this one. This is the question we had. Should clerics make laws? 81% of the people in Scotland said no. 95% of men said no. <laughs> so, I mean, I just find this, I mean, what, what is, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm slightly confused about why we should get that answer. Why men should be so vehemently opposed uh, to the notion. I mean, it's not hugely exceptional because you're looking at 81% of Scots, i.e. the people, uh, we're, we're talking about a, a group of out of a thousand. You know. but people are very badly disposed. So, if, if I, heaven forfend that that should ever be the case. The answer is most clerics are men. So is that why? Think so. Men don't like men. Is that what you're trying to say? Oh, I see. You're, are you saying men don't like men? I, I, maybe that's true. I don't know. Yeah. Because it'll be the, that's, that's the total. <laughs> yeah, but luckily the folks here are. Move, move to the left hand side here. Yeah. Sorry? Uh, all of them. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the House of Lords has to agree with the, uh, with the Commons. It has to, it's forced to agree in some cases, but it's always consulted. So therefore, the reality is that the House of Lords makes laws because the whole legislature consists of two houses. It's bicameral. And it has the House of Commons and it has the House of Lords. And it's there for a purpose. They're there to uh, oversee the processes of the House of Commons. And the clerics are all English clerics? No. Well, they're Scottish clerics. There's lots of uh, denominations in there. I don't, I don't know which country they come from. But there's 30. Sorry, continue. No, but is it, isn't there 30 from the, uh, the English, the Anglican Church? Yes, but there are other denominations represented too. Is the Church of Scotland? Is the Church of Scotland? I really don't know. I really no, don't I mean, know. so, I mean, as far as I'm but concerned... The reality is that 81% of Scots are opposed to the whole concept. 
So if I was in a position of having to defend the status quo, I would not go into a discussion saying that the House of Lords is a terrific institution because I'd be speaking to the 81% <laughs> of folks who are opposed to the whole concept. Mm -hmm. It could be, we, 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 could, we would know, we could establish that. I didn't take the trouble to do so. Okay. No, no, no that's, that's one word. And what, I need a sentence. No, it does exist. It does exist. It does exist. It's a collection of rules. <laughs> yes, that's that in theory. Over that's true. And that's precedent. true. And by precedent. Yeah. And they use this word arcane. Arcane. It's true too. Absolutely. Obscure. Obscure. <laughs> Terrific word. Obscure. Obscure. You know. So these. So we've had lots of words. Uh, arcane. Obscure. Nebulous. Nebulous. That's a good term too. I'm still looking for a sentence though. Sorry? Make it up as you go along. Yeah, yeah, you could say that, yeah. Okay. One word that describes the, the one sentence that describes the British Constitution. One sentence. Whatever the prevailing government wanted to be. That's precisely what it is. Foolish that. Yes. It is. He's been Googled. <laughs> Whatever the government day, the day. Where the working majority yeah. says it is. This is the important part here. Because some of you may be somewhat perplexed that Theresa May has gone to such extraordinary lengths to keep the DUP on board. That's why. Because without that working majority, she cannot determine what the Constitution is. Now, what's important about this is that she can literally make up the Constitution as she goes along provided she has that support. She can change your human rights. She can change your Scottish Parliament. She can abolish your Scottish Parliament if she has this. Because she is the Constitution. If she was replaced by Jeremy Corbyn, it would be exactly the same. Yes. In other words, your rights are held in this arrangement. You mean to tell me that to the 10 DUP people, they are running the country. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm saying something different. I would, I would suggest that she would jettison the DUP, provided the working majority could be achieved otherwise. And if they think they have some special place in her heart, uh, they might be about to be disabused of that. Yes, sir. We've seen this week that, that, that you know, there are two to me, we can't have a situation where a government just makes up the whole lot. I mean, they're, they're, they're held together. I know there's not a constitution, but there is precedence and there is framework. Yes. We've seen John Berkow kind of yes. reaching back to 1604 and saying, yeah. you can't do that. Of course he so, does. So it's not but entirely true to say well, that. No, it is actually. Let me explain why. It's, you make a good point. But the reality is, if they want to remove John Berkow, they can remove John Merkel. If they want to rerun a vote, they can rerun the vote. If, I mean, for example, so many people, sorry? What about Erskine May? Erskine May is a convention. It's not a law. Erskine May is, is quoted by the Speaker because he wants to prevent the government. It's, it's, like, a, it's like checks and balances where the checks are a, a lowercase c and a lowercase b. They exist but they only exist due to the sufferance of the government of the day. We used to execute uh, his men in his position in those days. Yeah, well, you should speak as well. But, but, but you, you make a good point. There are conventions. Of course there's Erskine May. Of course there's other precedents. If you go back, if you look at the whole compendium of the underpinnings of the theoretical British constitution, there's all these things. Mm. I'm simply saying to you, if you care to look closely at the way it actually operates, that's the way it actually operates. The, the government can change things overnight if it wants to. Yes, sir? Can you 
can you compare and contrast that with the US Constitution, say perhaps the German Constitution, the yeah. French Constitution, a person, you know, we've just been saying case that the party in power could override any existing institutions? No, because the, the, you missed the bit at the beginning. In, in, in all of those countries, there is an overarching set of laws which is beyond the reach of the government of the day. In order to amend the constitution in Germany, in France, in Ireland, in the United States, you need to submit to the various houses, the legislators, uh, uh, a proposal, and then it has to be put. And it, means, it needs to secure up to two-thirds of a majority or perhaps greater. So in other words, you, you, the, the, there's two things here. One is, in those countries, by and large, the people are sovereign. That's not the case here. You are not sovereign. You are, you are not citizens. You are all subjects, okay? You're subjects of the Crown and Parliament. In the UK, the sovereign entity is the Crown and Parliament. You are not sovereign. You are not sovereign. In those other countries, the people are sovereign, and they gift their sovereignty to the government in order to govern. But it's theirs. They can remove it any time they like. You can't. The claim of right is a moral document. It is not a legal document, and it can't be legal. I mean, for example, have you ever wondered why Article number one of the vow. You all remember the vow. Do you remember the vow? How can we forget it? How can you forget it? And if Article number one of the vow said, the Scottish Parliament will be permanent. Do you remember that? Yeah. That's what it said. The Scottish Parliament right now is not permanent. Do you know why? Why is the Scottish Parliament not permanent? Why didn't, why didn't Westminster simply write a little note saying, in future the Scottish Parliament is now permanent, like we promised? Why has not happened? Because they like lying. Sorry? They like lying. Well, maybe they do. But why? why? <laughs> because we don't have a constitution. <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. another election you can't guarantee. Of course, sir. Yeah. Yeah. No UK government can bind its successor. Right? So, for example, a <laughs> there can't be two sovereign entities. Right? Either Westminster is sovereign. Uh, or the Scottish Parliament is sovereign, but you, they can't have both at the same time. That's what the Brexit debate was all about. Do you remember? It was about, we wanted to return sovereignty. So therefore, there was no practical way of the sovereign entity creating another sovereign entity. It's a contradiction in terms. The Scottish Parliament could never have been permanent. And anybody with a modicum of constitutional understanding would have understood that right from the get-go. It, it was an impossibility. And yet, it was sold on the basis that you know, the government would do it. So that, yes? Given the UK system, the sovereign is sovereign. No, 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 no. The Crown and Parliament is sovereign. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a nebulous con concept. But what it means is that they have a symbiotic relationship uh, in the sense that w one cannot exist without the other. But if push came to shove, and the, the sovereign would make, go to enormous lengths to prevent that from being the case, and should be well advised to do so, uh, is that parliament will exercise its sovereignty and change the monarch for another monarch that's more, who's more amenable. And they've done that in the past. And that, that was essentially, if you read the development of the English state, that's essentially how it came about. So there you are. So if you're wondering what the constitution actually is, as opposed to what it is stated theoretically to be, that's what it is. I want to mention this to you. If you're building a house, right, the most important part of the house when you're building is the, con is, the, is the foundations. That's what the constitution is. It's not complicated, right? You get the foundations right, the house will hopefully stay upright. 
But if you don't spend any time on this, then I can absolutely guarantee you the house will not be standing up in the years ahead. You've got to deal with the foundations. You've got to deal with what's important. You've got to deal with your, the morality and the values and the principles before you do anything else. That's not the way things quite work in Scotland. Because in Scotland, this has been built, this has been built, and that's been built, and this hasn't actually happened. So, when, I'm, when the Growth Commission gets stick about uh, the currency, etc., etc., part of the reason is because if you don't define what sort of growth you want, it's very hard to decide how to bring about it. I mean, if you think about it, it's a bit like designing the kitchen or the windows without having this in place. Because if you start working on this, as sure as fate, somebody's going to come along and say, well, why is it that shape? My view is that the best sort of windows are, are this shape. And you get into a lot of discussion about why it was, and that, that's because this bit wasn't done. Okay, so we're up here just now, we're putting bits and pieces all over the place. And I'd rather hope that somewhere on the line, the government would say, look, let's get this pinned down. John, can I, can I ask a question sure. here? Because you've already said without a solid foundation constitution, then you can't have a solid edifice on the top. And yet the UK doesn't have a solid constitution and has an edifice on top that's lasted quite a wee while. Yeah, it, 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 it can only exist if all of the parties to it stick to the conventions. And tell the same line. And, sorry? And tell the same line. If you want to put it that way. Um, <laughs> but what's happened more recently is that the Prime Minister has discovered that conventions are simply conventions. They are not laws. She's not bound by any of this. Her predecessors always had a moral code that said intrinsically, if I break the convention, my government breaks the convention, the next government might do the same. So through a process of self-preservation, if not any higher calling, nobody broke the conventions. In other words, if you lost a vote in the House of Commons, the only thing was to step down. But that was purely a convention. And what happens when a Prime Minister comes along and says, see that convention? Not for me. And I'm going to have a vote again and again and again. And eventually what happens is that the Speaker, who has a very minor position in all of this, decides he's had enough. But he can be replaced. Uh, yes? If you remember the building was a parliament, it was built in a shivering day. When it falls down, we'll be stuck again. <laughs> So, if you're going to design a Scottish constitution, what are the, what are the priorities? You're, you're creating a new state. What, what priorities would a new state, would you want a new state to have? You've looked at the existing state and you've decided, I don't like it. I want to change it. Okay, now here's your chance to create a new state. Yes, well, sir. There's got to be two fundamentals. First being the mechanism for changing the constitution, because no, mm -hmm. nothing can be said. Indefinitely. And second, there's the right to dissent. Sure. The, 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 those are part of the process. Uh, uh, what I'd like to deal with just now is, are the priorities. What? I, think the, I think the people being sovereign. Yeah. The people being sovereign. Yeah. Well, that, that's, uh, that's essentially the, the piece of the 1324 coalition. Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, John, don't you start with your values and principles? You do start with your values and principles. Absolutely. You start off, you remember the foundations? You, 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 well, this is it. You have to decide as a, a, a nation what's important to you. What do you stand for? And what will you not stand for? And that's what values and principles are. If you want to deal person to person with somebody, it's hugely important to know that you share some values. Now, you as a country are going to be in the position, if you are able to secure your goal of independence, of working all this out. You've got to do it. You know, it's, you, you know, every other country that became independent did it. I'll tell you a great irony, because somebody earlier asked me about Germany. And, and who wrote the German constitution? British. Yes. 
The Foreign Office wrote the, British, the German Constitution. Not only did it write the German Constitution, it wrote the, the, the Barbadian Constitution. Yeah, you, 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 you name it. it, it the, the Foreign Office has written constitutions for around about 40 to 50 countries. <laughs> and it doesn't have one of its own. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, but both. Both. The Indian Constitution was written in London. Uh, the, no, the, the, and I do believe, I mean, I've yet to check this, but I would give them to understand that some constitutions were called interim because they were written without that fundamental stage of going to the people who are sovereign to get their endorsement. So it had to be interim, it had to be draft. I do believe, I, I need to check this, and maybe somebody here knows this, that the German constitution, the one that operates in the federal public right now, is still the interim version given by the British. So, you know, it, it, but yet there isn't one here. But yeah, you're right. You need to deal with the values and the principles. So the values and the principles have to be then enshrined in law. They're enshrined in the constitution. And they're outside the reach of the government of the day. Because they're part of you. They're not part of a government. See... The, the, the mindset in the UK is the government and the constitution are one and the same. We, we talked about that earlier. And that, there are a few checks and balances, but by and large, everyone agrees to be gentlemen and ladies and nobody's going to contradict each other, etc., etc. But at the end of the day, the end of the day, it's about shared values. And you're going to have to work out what those are for you. And you really have to do this. You, you really have to do it. Because if you don't, then you are about to demonstrate you, you leave yourself terribly exposed in this new world that you hope to enter. You want to create a new state. We talked about that earlier. You said that. I put that point to you. You agreed with me. You want to create a new state. You have a responsibility in that new state. And I'm going to suggest here are some of the priorities in terms of values. Inclusion. Who is going to be a citizen of the new state? Who's not wanted in the new state? The Queen isn't. Oh. Royalty. Hmm? Royalty is not wanted. Why is that? It's just, uh, just another direction, isn't it? If you want a republic or you want a monarchy, you want to be a subject. No, we're not talking, well, no, hold on a we're not talking about a republic or a monarchy. We're talking about the average Joe citizen. And I'm asking you who should not be included in this new state? Anybody who doesn't pay tax over the age be eligible to vote. So you, so you, so you, you can't be a citizen unless you pay tax. Can you get this right? Anybody who doesn't want us to recognise the constitution. No, there's lots of people who don't like constitutions. Well, anyone who bears arms against you, you know, that would be the normal thing. Well, that, that might be covered by a, a law against uh, sedition or whatever. But who, who should not be included? Everybody should be included. Yeah. Well, no, because the whole battle can't be set up. So you have to exclude. You have to have some qualification. Well, of once you start qualifying, you start defining it. Once you start looking at people. Okay. But that's the question. But, but you, see, see, see this, this is what's interesting about this debate. Isn't it interesting? This is what grown-up countries do. This is what grown-up countries do. Right? You need, to, you need to think about this, because it's important. If you're talking about your values and principles, you need to decide if you're for inclusion or not, and what sort of inclusion you're for. This is grown up now. This is, this is the real world. Every country does this, okay? This is why we don't have a constitution. <laughs> <laughs> you, you see, it, see how it gets interesting all of a sudden? I, I, th this is the other one you need to look at very seriously. Popular sovereignty. What does that mean? What it means is that you, you, everybody here is sovereign. You decide things. It's your values and principles that determine how the state behaves. You grant the state permission to do things. But ultimately, you are in charge. Right? This is an alien concept in the UK. 
So I can understand why not everyone immediately thinks, but it's grown up. That's what grown up countries are. They, they, are, they have popular sovereignty. Sovereignty is vested in the people. That's the terminology they use. What that means is you are sovereign. Is there a difference between England and Scotland? I always think we in Scotland are sovereign. No, you're not sovereign. No, I'm sorry, you're not sovereign. You're a subject. You're a subject. What does your passport say? What does your passport say? Yeah, what does your passport say? That's why I'm subject. It says you're a subject. We feel Ah! That's a different thing. That's yeah. sentiment. And, and you may feel morally that you are, but I'm talking in a legal sense legal now. Sense. Okay, you're, you're all subjects. And my suggestion is that if you're going to create a new state, then you should be sovereign. You should decide. And everything comes back to you for approval through a process that you decide is appropriate. But if you're going to have a constitution, do you not have to protect the minority. Of course. So you can never have a popular mandate to That's what that persecute is. Catholics or whatever. You know, you or, anybody you know, or anybody else. Or anybody else. Or people who are bold and, you know, well, you know exactly. You know, you're but right. Sure, you're absolutely sure, right. Sure you need to you, you, yeah, that's why you need to define this. Uh -huh. but, but my suggestion to you is that this is, this is equally important in terms of priority. This is the other one that's important. I, I speak to lots of SNP and YES groups. And I find when we reach this point in the presentation, people look and say, what, sorry, what, what, what is this? Reass who, who needs reassurance? Let me explain to you who needs reassurance. All the people who are opposed to independence. All the people who are skeptical about independence. Because think about this. Because if you don't think about it, you surely will. How do I know? Let's say I'm opposed to the whole idea. I think it's hateful. I think there's too many divisions in the world. And I'm opposed. I don't think there should be a separate state. I think it's an alien concept. So, how do I know that if you good people get your way, that I will not be victimized on Independence Day? Explain to me how I know that. You do. I don't. Well, why the hell should I support you then? Possibly won't. Really? You don't think you should reach out to me and try and reassure me? On the day we become a separate state, you become sovereign. How do I know that? The people. We make a bad part of the Constitution. But where is the Constitution? We will make it very quickly that day. Oh, you're going to make it on Independence Day. Ah, I see. So. Let me get this right now, shall I? Because I'm a simple, I'm a simple minded, I'm a simple minded guy. <laughs> On Independence Day, all of a sudden, a whole bunch of people are going to leap up and say, "You're not going to be victimised, John." Is that right? Is that the way this is going to work? Of course. <laughs> I can say it. You can say it. What authority do you have? With the greatest of respect, right? I'd feel slightly happier if your first minister said it, but, you know, because <laughs> with respect, I think her authority probably exceeds yours. But, at the end, but nobody's actually said that to me. Nobody's actually said to me, I'm a post-independence, that I will not be victimized on Independence Day for voting against this new state. Don't you think I'm entitled to reassurance? Yes. So why haven't you given it to me then? Why don't you reassure me that I will not be victimized on your Independence Day? How do I know that you will not produce a failed state like Zimbabwe? What have you done to reassure me? What steps have you taken so that I don't feel victimized on your Independence Day? There will always be somebody who doesn't. <laughs> It'll only have the Tories. <laughs> you see? You see? Now, I, I, sorry? These people have to be reminded that an independent Scotland can still have a respectful unity with England. How do I know that? Because that's what everyone should strive to attain. Who says so? Me. You say so. <laughs> is, is this not right to my original point, the right to dissent? 
the rights of James Gunn and the rights of the Senate. No, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. No, I'm, I'm asking you a simple question. I'm asking you to reassure me that I will not be victimised on Independence Day because I voted against the new state. So you'll be told that you will have, have as many rights and uh, proper uh, controls on mm -hmm. you as I would share the same okay. balances, okay. Where am I, how am same, I same how access okay. to, to legal systems. I applaud that. I think that's a wonderful thing. How, how did I get, how did you tell me that? Because I have it, you by definition don't. How do I know that? I'm assuring you that. Yes, but who are you? What the basic expects you? Well, this is going to refer to the values then. Hold on a second. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. Exactly. Exactly. What you do is you draw up a constitution and you go to all these folks who need reassurance and you tell them right now. Here's a piece of paper. This is our contract with all of you. Regardless of how you, vote, how you plan to vote in any independence referendum, you will not be victimised, whatever the result. Right? Isn't that simple, straightforward logic? Why are those folks not entitled to reassurance if you get what you want? Can I ask who would write this yeah. constitution? Well, would, you it come, be, would it be the Scottish government? Maybe they might start it. Um, if you, no, I'll come on to that in a second if I need. <laughs> but all I'm asking you to think about is this. Right? By, not, by not having a written constitution now, you fail to reach the folks who need reassurance. I don't have reassurance, I'm sorry, but we've lived with no assurance from the government and yet we still live in Scotland. Of course you do. Yeah. So, Absolutely, you know, isn't it? So why wouldn't the others, the, on the other side, I mean, we are a community. There is a community. See, this, is, this is the SAP issue. With the greatest of respect, the SAP issue is you're all very nice folks. <laughs> you're all nice. <laughs> but the <laughs> trouble is... The Tories are not nice. <laughs> the trouble with being nice is you have to write it down that you're going to continue to be nice. Yeah. Otherwise, I don't know that you're not going to turn from nice to nasty. And but also, I mean, you talk as if we've been treated nicely. I'm, no, no, I'm not saying that. No, no, it's about, I'm not, no, no, with respect, I'm not saying that. I'm saying you need, if you want to reach these folks who need reassurance, you have to take action. You can't simply say, because I'm nice, I'll always be nice, because you don't know that. Let me, a simple fact. Who is going to be the government after independence? Who Sorry? You don't know that. No. You don't know that. You don't know who the government's going to be, and therefore why should I feel reassured that you want to create a new state? You've just said to me you don't know who the government's going to be. Good point. Well, last time we did this nonsense, you were talking about you didn't know which currency you were going to use. Mm. Now you're telling me you don't know what the government's going to be. Are you saying that we should not be canvassing without having a written constitution because a lot of the talk on the streets is reassuring people that you meet. Exactly. Most of the and that, that's the point I want to make, sir. I, I, I wasn't being flippant with you. I, mean, I, hope, I hope you didn't think so. I, I'm saying you're throwing away a huge advantage that you have by not reassuring people in a written contract right now that they will not be victimised. You, 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 you do not allow yourself to reach out to people who are sceptical. And that's in your gift right now, the people in this room. And folks are entitled to reassurance. They're fully entitled. And because you're nice, it's not reassurance. What people want to see is a piece of paper that says categorically that in any new state, they will not be victimized. You're assuming that the people will be saying, various groups of people will believe what you say. Not me. Because, because to go around the doorsteps, you know that you sometimes would come across people who are foreign nationals yeah. and they say, what will happen to us? Exactly. And so they, <coughs> they end up, they don't vote for us. Yeah, well, they, they, they don't vote for us. I think that's a perfect... They, they need to... Don't you think they, that's a perfectly reasonable position yes, to take? I mean, you're, 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 I mean you, you're just awfully nice. But you have to be more than nice. You have to actually sit down and write in a piece of paper. I guarantee you, in this new state, that you will not be victimised. You can't be, can it? Well, you know, you can't a new government after of course, of independence. Course. But what you can do, though, as we said earlier, 
you can draw up a constitution that places that at its core. Yes. Are, are uh, and in the process of doing this? Who's doing it? There's a, I watch Indy Indy cover, and he's always buying on about this. Yeah. There's a guy who's actually written it. He took it to the Parliament the other Andrew day. But, uh, no, 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 it's, no, it's Mark McNaught. Mark McNaught. Uh, just, oh, no. th just let, let me explain something to you. In, in, in 2014, if you care to look at the document which the Scottish Government drew up, it actually pledged to an interim constitution. I can say that with some assurance because I wrote it. Yeah. And it was regarded as fundamental as part of that package that it included a commitment to a written constitution. I'm suggesting to you things need to be a bit f more advanced than that. In other words, you throw away a major advantage if you don't actually commit in writing that you will protect everyone in the country, regardless of how they might choose to vote in an independence referendum. And there's much more chance that people are reassured that they're going to come over and listen to the rest of your argument. But somebody who feels that they're going to be victimised is not going to be listening to you. So you owe it to them. It's not their responsibility to reassure you. It's your responsibility to reassure them. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I don't know. Possibly. I, I wouldn't have too much of an argument with that. Yes, sir. Victimisation and what respect to be victimised by what matter? Well, for example, the, 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 it's not uncommon for new states that are formed to say those who didn't support its establishment won't be regarded as citizens. Sure. Yeah. How do I know? I'm a post-independence. How do every, I know every, that's not going to happen to me? Every, every individual's vote is a secret function. No, but I, I've been open about what it. You, what, what an individual votes for is uh, oh. private and confidential. Well, I, don't mean the, I don't mean the technical part. I mean, I'm, I'm actually an outspoken opponent of independence. How do I know that if you get your wish, that your first thing you do on Independence Day is to say, I'm going to get rid of him, and the Tories, you know, you know, I mean, you, you've already said. But we don't have anything. That's my no, point. No, no, no. We're working around this. We've already said that anyone that presides yes. in Scotland for two Great. years automatically agree. becomes a I agree with all subject. Of that. But or a where, subject where, where is it written down? Well, well, if Nicola Sturgeon came out uh, as our government in a temporary basis, we will understand this is temporary because we cannot get this constitution. I want in the next week. And we can have the constitution written this Moral. week. So, so if so if our government, in particularly somebody like Nick, I mean, we that says these what you're talking about, we will have an inclusive, we will have a constitution, and blah blah blah. That has to be a temporary solution to this problem because we can't wait for the constitution for the next independence referendum. At least I hope not. Well, I, 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 would, I would I would agree with you. No, 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 no. I, I just I just feel that. These are fairly fundamental things, they're not complicated. Sure, sure, but you're suggesting, John, that if you have the Constitution, that will be supportive towards the process of independence. I'm saying you will remove some of the concerns that people yes. rightly have. Yeah, but you will, bring in, you will bring in a big one, which is if you're saying popular sovereignty is vested yes. in the people, that is a direct challenge to sovereignty in Parliament. Of course. Which means a lot, you can imagine the press turning to a Republican. Mm -hmm. Versus monarchy. But that's grown up, that's grown up, mature. Yeah. Uh, you, the, 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 the important thing here, as I said earlier, you're in the process of building a new state, okay? It's, it's, it's quite a complicated business, right? It's, it's not straightforward. And all I'm suggesting to you tonight is you've got to get the fundamentals right. I mean, when the Americans were talking about a new state, they were very clear. They wrote things down. They said, this is the sort of new state we're thinking about having. Uh, uh, you, 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 there was, there were Alexander Hamilton and others were involved. Uh, but, <coughs> if I could say in your defence that Nicola makes lots of statements about if you live and work here, consider yourself a Scot. Yes. But correct me if I'm wrong, but that, that has no substance no. because it's not constitutional. No. And, and those people, in spite of our reassurances, are leaving. 
and are anxious. With but the but they're, they're right to be anxious, yes, sir. I, I was just going to say, these are hugely important point because I think we forget as, as Scots, and in world terms, we are quite a small country, but we're very tribal. Yes. There's a lot of bigotry and sectarian in Scotland, and that's, I would suggest that's exactly that, that would have to be aimed at people like that because you've got two divides. In such a small country, but, but that's not unusual. Yeah. I mean, yes, if you if you go to Belgium, for example, you'll find there's divides. The division is not necessarily. I'm not for division. I'm simply saying to you that's what grown-up countries do. They they, they 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 have regard for their citizens, and sometimes the citizens don't always agree on something. Now that's not that's not horrible or uh, to be avoided. That's just. The way people are, and you and you accept it, and you you go with it. Any limitations to what you're just saying? In terms of anything, any any group, any type of person that would be excluded. I that's for you to decide. It's your constitution. See, th this is what I see. I find this exciting, but 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 of course, what you do is you, you study the constitutions in the rest of the world, and you say, I want to have a constitution like this. And you, you draw up a draft. And what you do is you put that draft to the people long before Independence Day, long before any referendum, and you say, this is our contract between this new state and its citizens of this new state. It's the state's obligations to them and, its respons and, this, and the, the individual's responsibilities to the state. And you define it. You're, it's just been grown up and it's about state building. And it's hugely important. Is the Scottish government working in this? Are they taking what I would, you're saying on board I would, and are I, they working I, on it now? I don't know. I'm not a member of the SNP, that's, so I don't know. Some particular party which does have no job. Yes, okay, okay. And some particular party which has to say that and present it. Okay. No. And then, presumably... But, but, you, you, but I assume you're all members of the SNP, so you... you uh, if all three parties do that... There's a motion okay. going up to conference supported by Joanna Cherry, one of our members here, under Liz Campbell in the centre of the SNP, and it's to do with the formation of citizens' assemblies. I like, I like that. Joanna's mind I like is that. to give the opportunity for groups of people of all parties, yeah. of all views and independence, to get together yeah. and discuss this sort of thing now. So, so are we told, if you haven't voted in the order of motion that you're going to conference as a delegate, please do that and make sure that motion gets the... There's a, there's, a lovely, there's a lovely Irish example here. But before I get into that, how many referenda have taken place in Ireland over the last 20 years? Two. 35. Grown-up countries can do these things because they've got written constitutions. And you know what happens sometimes? They have a referendum in Ireland. The government doesn't like the answer. It says, OK, we'll tweak it and we'll come back to you again. Even on very serious subjects like abortion, right? Because some people will say, yeah, but the Irish will never deal with, like, it's like the Swiss. They're dealing with this sort of trivial stuff about, you know, uh, um, how, 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 how many oranges can we consume in a week or something. It's not like that. We, it, it, grown up countries can handle referenda because they sit down and work out how to do it. They don't just take a leap in the dark and say, hey, we're gonna have a referendum. And what's going to happen thereafter? I haven't a clue. I haven't a clue. So, we, we, I think we've done this one to death. This is equally important. I'm a new state. I've arrived on the world stage. What do I stand for? How do I know what you stand for? Depends to what extent you're able to convey what you stand for and write it into meaningful form. Exactly. I, I'm, you do this ahead of time because what you want to do is on Independence Day is not to have a bunch of people saying, I don't know what the heck you stand for. Because I watched your independence referendum and some of your people said this and some of your people said that. I have no idea. Five of your people contradicted your first minister she was, when she was on stage, so I have no idea what you stand for. And you say, but I'm a nice person. You can, you can trust me. I'm, I'm, I'm SNP. I'm a nice folks. And, you've got you to write it down. You've got to say to people overseas who you plan to trade with that you're honourable, that you can be trusted. 
and that you believe in certain values and certain principles and you want to join the community of nations on that basis, you write it down. If it's important to you, why don't you write it down so we all know where you come from? Right? And why haven't you done it? <laughs> okay, we're moving on because uh, th these are some of the things you can do if you, if you personally want to get involved in looking at constitutions. Educate yourself. Uh, you know, I want to show you something here. And it's, uh, it's, it's really staggering if I can find it in some senses. It's a... It's a it's a book that uh, is used in the States. Uh, I don't have it to hand. I'll dig it out later. But it's, it's a little book on the US Constitution, which all seven-year-olds in the United States get. And it explains what the US Constitution is, the checks and balances, what the Senate does, what the President does what the House of Representatives does. Educate yourself. You can buy some books produced by Dr. Elliot Bulmer or Mark McNaught. And if you don't want to pay for a book, you can go to the Foundations of Freedom on the Common Wheel site and you can download his fundamental principles that we talked about earlier. So I claim no credit for the priorities. I am simply piggybacking on better minds than mine. <laughs> And I'm suggesting you take advantage of that data as well. So you can get this free download, Foundations of Freedom, which goes into all of the stuff that we talked about just two or three minutes ago in much greater detail. Avoid seeing the Constitution as a hygiene factor. Does everyone know what a hygiene factor is? It's business consultancy speak. And I, I regret that we're using it, but I can't think of a better expression. A hygiene factor is something you have to do, but you don't really believe in it. In other words... Uh, we, have, we have to, we have to, uh, we have to, it's health and safety or whatever. Yeah, we've got a guy that looks after health and safety, uh, not me. I don't, he looks after health and safety. Uh, so it's just something we do. Don't see the Constitution as a hygiene factor. It's essential. It's central. It's about you. So it's not about box ticking. It's about you. And you're important. You're sovereign. So it's not about box ticking. So avoid using this sort of terminology. Use the Constitution as a reassurance for skeptics and those opposed. Don't miss a trick here, please. And back initiatives to develop a written Constitution for Scotland. There's all sorts of things going on out there. If there isn't anything that meets your requirements, start one of your own. You're sovereign after all. Be the change that you want to be. Be the change that you want to be. If you think of yourself as sovereign, and many of you do, I think most of you do, then act in a sovereign fashion. Here are some of the books by Elliot Bulmer, if you're interested. A Moral Constitution for Scotland uh, and A Constitution for the Common Good. Because he didn't think this one was left-wing enough, so he produced another one. <laughs> 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 and, that, and that wasn't his fault, that was my fault. Because I said, oh, there's a lot of stuff in here which will frighten the horses. Uh, it might frighten the horses. You say, well, I'm not fussed about the horses being frightened. This is, this is what I want. So anyway, uh, do get the second edition because the first edition is not nearly as good. But do, do get his books. They're, they're fantastic. He's a fantastic guy. This is the one I talked to earlier about earlier. The common real policy, it's, uh, this is the way they chose to market it. I have no idea why. Foundations for Freedom. <coughs> okay, summary. The British Constitution is an oxymoron. Okay. Uh, it's a contradiction in terms. Uh, it can be changed at a whim. It provides you with absolutely no reassurance. Uh, it provides you with almost no protection. Um, in the same way that... Has anyone here seen a movie called The Matrix? There's a scene in the movie where... Uh, the principal guy who's confused by a lot of things that's happened in life uh, is confronted by a character who says to him, there's a blue pill and a red pill. If you choose the blue pill, your life will change forever. Are you sure you want to choose? Because if you choose the red pill, you go back to where you were before. I've just offered you the blue pill tonight. Okay? 
because nothing will ever be the same again. The way you look at it. So, the British Constitution is oxymoron. There's very limited understanding of constitutional matters. Uh, so, some people are busy working on, say, uh, a similar thing to uh, what the Americans had at one time, uh, the four freedoms, the four foundations, the four principles that people can use on doorsteps. Don't let the limited understanding get in your way because you have things to do. Uh, that's, as far as I'm concerned, that's the most important message to take away from tonight. You need a written constitution now. Not tomorrow, not after Independence Day, not after Easter Monday. You need it now. Because it's killing you not having it. And you ought to feel, because you're sovereign, that it's part and parcel of who you are. This is the way you express yourself. You're this is how you tell the world what the new state will stand for and what it will not stand for. Okay? Is it going to be easy? No. Citizens' assemblies? Fantastic. The Irish use them all the time. I applaud it. It's a terrific idea because what it means is that you can't get that right away. You have to have some sort of convention and there you are. Citizens' assemblies. So that you can refine the process. A group of experts can develop a draft but then it has to go out for general approval, okay? And this is where you can involve people who don't support independence because it's in their interest to see their selves protected in any new state. And everyone can play a part because you're sovereign. Why, why shouldn't you play a part like everyone else in this room and everyone else in Edinburgh and everyone else in Scotland? Is it going to be easy? No, it's not going to be easy. Was it easy for any other country, a new state? No, it wasn't. But they all did it. Has anyone, has any of the, have any of these new states abandoned their constitution? Not a bit of it. Only the ones that failed. They abandoned it. They abandoned it too sweet as soon as the government of the day got power. Of course they amend them. Constitutions are not a panacea. I don't want anyone to leave here tonight thinking, hey, if we have a constitution, all of our problems go away. That's not why it works. It, it, what, it, what it says is that this is your declaration to the world and to yourselves. Does it need amendment from time to time? Of course it does. Because you change. So your constitution needs to change with you. It's common sense, really. But everyone can play a part. Really, seriously. This is your reality. Remember the blue pill and the red pill? Yeah. This is your reality. You've taken the blue pill. This is, this, is, this is you. This is your reality right now. Brexit is happening in a country where the winner takes all the elections, no written constitution, where all democratic rights depend solely on the goodwill, self-restraint, moderation, and moral responsibility of the party and government. Terrifying. And if you're not, t I said you'd be scared, didn't I? Did I say that? I hope you're scared now, because that's your reality, okay? And you have it. You have the power. You have the power to change that. Because I can tell you, this lot here are not going to change it. So if you want that not to be your reality, then you are going to have to take steps to make sure it isn't. That's the end of my presentation, ladies well and gentlemen. Well Any questions? Oh, my hands. I'll, I'll take Isabel yeah, first. We'll have to, we'll have to use oh, you have to use that. So, Tony, just pass that back to Tony. I just pass it around. It's switched on. First of all, I'd like to congratulate you on what I think is the most fundamental presentation I've heard in the SNP club in the last few years, particularly the whole question of inclusion and responsibility. Um, it begins to give a little bit of the answer 
as to how we get through to the 55% who do not want to support us at this moment in time. But I, I apologize for being late this evening, but I wanted to dig something out of my library. And here is a package of documents produced by the SNP in spring 1978. In it in, included, amongst bits and pieces on land ownership, trade, justice, a 10-page document called the Constitution, there you are. which was written by a panel of experts. I wasn't on this particular panel, I was in the one on employee rights. And I'd like to ask people in here, and perhaps yourself, sir, why has it taken 41 years for this party to realise what is the most fundamental principle in gaining independence? Um, is this on? Yeah. This on, is it? Um, you won't necessarily have the answers to this, but there's a lot of divisions just now that are massed at the moment and will come to the fore if we gain our independence, and when we gain our independence, I should say, and uh, it's whether or not some of these can or should be tackled in any constitutional discussion. I'm thinking, for example, of the nuclear question and membership of NATO and yep. what was mentioned earlier in relation to the monarchy. Yep. Now, um, my hope is we could look at these things once we're independent and deal with them. But listening to your um, presentation, it might be we really do need to look at them just now and make a statement, but that discussion could be very, very divisive, and we may gain as many people for independence as we'd lose. So it's just really putting that down as yes. thoughts, as a reaction yeah. to what you've said in a very interesting talk. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I think you make a very good point, it, but it's unavoidable. That's what grown-ups do. You know, they, 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 they're disputatious. We, we all are. Yes, sir? Yeah, my question was really about the process for writing a constitution. I mean, how long does it take? I imagine it probably doesn't take very long when somebody sits down to, to, to write it because yeah. they're not terribly long documents. Uh, no. But also, more importantly, how do you get it? How do you get buy-in from the population? I mean, when the Americans and French wrote theirs, it was a bunch of guys in a room that yeah. sat down and wrote it and said, there you go, lads, this is what's happening. But, you yeah. know, in the 21st century, it's a bit different. Yeah, of course it is. And, and one of the differences is that we won't have a constitution as the US does where somebody who's black is two-thirds of a person. Um, but, uh, and that's still in the US constitution, by the way. Uh, they, but th th that reflected their reality at that time. Uh, yes, uh, generally the way these things are done, I would commend Eliot's books to you, because he goes through it step by step. But essentially what you do is you, you, you gather a group of people together, a fairly small group, and they produce a draft. And then you go to your citizens' assemblies, and they respond to the draft. And you try and involve as many people as possible, as practical, in your citizens' assemblies. You don't have to have one, you have to have lots, you could have lots. The Irish do it all the time. And you, so you gather people together and you're looking for their reaction and their response to the draft. And the draft changes. And it should change because it's you. It's your citizens' assembly that changes it. And gradually through a process of iteration, you end up moving from a draft to an interim. You cannot have a full-blooded constitution until it has the endorsement of the new state, by the citizens of the new state, which is why when we discussed it in 2014 with Alex Salmond, we agreed it ought to be called an interim constitution because you do need, once the new state is formed, for it to have popular endorsement. But not to have an interim is, uh, uh, well, we've talked about that. Would you see the new constitution having had it written? No, I think what happens is that the, the, the constitution deals with values and principles, to the to the extent to the extent that the citizens of the new state feel appropriate. Underneath that is the great corpus of laws, and those may or may not remain the same. I suspect they probably will remain for the foreseeable future. But then, as the new state forms itself, and remember, the new state is not necessarily going to be born in benign circumstances. This is just something you need to, uh, it's terribly important. Not everyone is going to give you their blessing. It's just not the way things work. Somebody somewhere is going for, for whatever arcane reason is going to say, 
I just hate the whole idea. And, and, and if you don't have something you've if you haven't committed yourself, effectively you allow the other person a blank check to denigrate what you're trying to do. There was a question here, I think, and then we'll take one back. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Well. Uh, the document would really be a campaign. Well, uh, that's my and proposal. And we would have things that we thought were contentious to the bigger public, like we wouldn't mention our view of the SNP's view on the monarchy, for example. You need to think very seriously about, about these issues. Yes, sir. It's more a historical question. <laughs> was the French constitution the, the first one that was ever written? Or was this the no, there's been lots. It's like the US constitution. The US constitution has remained the same. It's a dead document, but it's been amended. Yeah. Uh, and it's been amended sometimes for good and sometimes for ill. I mean. <laughs> No, no, the, the, the Americans, in the, in the sense that we understand constitutions today, the American really was the first constitution. Did they not, did they not copy they, they did, and they, they copied each other back and forth. Right. But, I mean, for me, sharing a, a historical uh, perspective with you, uh, I'm a great fan of a guy called Benjamin Franklin. Uh, I mean, for me, Benjamin Franklin is one of these... There's lots of other people in the U.S. constitutional story in the, uh, who get top billing. Alexander <laughs> Hamilton, because he was romantic. Anyone who dies in a duel, come on, give me a break. <laughs> you know, come on. And he's shot by a future president. I mean, come on. Uh, he's also half Scots. It's half, well, mostly Scots, in fact. Uh, yeah. But uh, well, you can trust the Scots to cause trouble wherever they go. Uh, 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 so, picture the scene. Benjamin Franklin. Uh, is charged by George Washington to go to Paris uh, as the ambassador <laughs> of a putative new state uh, and say to the French king, uh, we need your help against the British. Uh, we're short of money and materiel, uh, but money in particular. And he says to the king, uh, and this is the new state we hope to form. And it says, at the beginning of the document, all men are created equal. <laughs> now you have to have a, you have to have balls <laughs> to do that. With the greatest of respect, you have to have cojones the size of Edinburgh to walk into the royal chamber and say, I don't think you're special. <laughs> uh, I think you should give us money because we think everyone's special. Uh, and he pulled it off. Yes, yes. I mean, come on, <laughs> give me a break here. This guy pulled it off. There would be no American state without French money. That's a fact. Because where was the money going to come from to put shoes on the troops? Where's the, I mean, most of the troops went home, by the way, when they weren't fighting to till the fields. You know, only the British had a standing army. And it was the best in the world. It was the best in the world. And you have to have a lot of help if you're going to beat the best in the world. So, you know, the, the reality is that there's lots of involved in setting up a new state. But all I'm suggesting to you is you need to do the bits that you can do. Right? And, and that won't be benign, necessarily. You can't assume. You hope for the best, but you plan for the worst. But you've got to get the fundamentals in place. Because if you don't do that, you don't have anything to... Literally, you don't have anything to stand on. I think there were some yeah. other questions. <laughs> Sorry, Barry. Thank you. Sorry, Barry. <laughs> no problem. Uh, given what we're going to be asked on the doorstep, is there examples of Commonwealth countries that declare the sovereignty of the people without the advocating the abolition of the monarchy? Because that's what we're going to get asked. Well, you know, all of these countries... All of the Caribbean countries, for example, uh, agreed a written constitution with the British before they became independent. Uh, I mean, this, what we're talking about is to go into an independence referendum without a written constitution is the oddity. The common place is to have a constitution in place and to say to the people, when we're independent, this is the draft we'll be working to. That's what most countries do. 
because it's required. Otherwise, nobody knows what the heck they're talking about. Uh, so, it's, it, you know, if you look at the, the, the constitutions of Barbados and, and these other countries, I mean, that, that's the, I find that fascinating, the fact that the, there's only a, it's a small island, Barbados, for crying out loud. It's only 21 miles from top to bottom. But they have a written constitution. It Somebody does, sat down and... It does it declare the sovereignty of the people. It does. Yeah, the so, and they still have the monarchy. The they still have a head of state. Now, th this is important. A head of state does not necessarily have any power. The constitution determines what power or lack of power the head of state has. Many heads of state are purely titular. But, but they can have great influence. They can, when there's a, an issue where the politicians cannot sort things out. You have to have some entity that holds the jackets when the politicians... But the difference is, and this is a big difference, is that they're doing that within a context of the constitution. Nobody can suggest something that's outside, that's unconstitutional, because everyone knows what the constitution is. And if you don't, you can go to a piece of paper and you say, this is what we agreed at the beginning. So therefore, what you're proposing, we can't go with. For example, give you an example, and this may be specious, or it may be real. Independence, you've, you've got what you wanted. Independence Day has taken place. Your prime minister, your first minister, has gone into negotiations with the UK government. The UK government says, uh, we, uh, we're prepared to cut a deal. But we have to talk about Trident. You see, there are complications here. And we really would like, um, we're not speaking alone here. Um, uh, President Trump is with us, uh, the French are with us, uh, President Macron. and uh, We all feel the same way. For the time being, I'm sorry, Trident has to stay. So now we're into a bargain. We're, 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 we're trading. Uh, think how powerful it would be if the Scottish negotiator could say, I'd love to talk, but the Constitution <laughs> requires all nuclear weapons to be removed. Yes. So I'm sorry, yes, yes. I can't continue with this discussion. It's outside my remit. But right now there isn't that protection. Uh, there's only what the SNP policy says. But they will say, but that's just SNP policy, you can change that. We suggest that's what you do now. And in return we will give you this, and this, and this, and this. That's the way it works. <coughs> yes. Back in the early noughties, uh, Professor Neil McCormick did draft a draft constitution yep. for Scotland and that could possibly start, uh, serve as a starting point for our, our discussions yep. and Edinburgh Central supported the motion going forward uh, along with Joanna Cherry to conference which is um, suggesting citizens assemblies and mm -hmm. one of the things that a citizens assembly could do is to start um, devising a new constitution and this would be an excellent way for um, to bring people on board who are not necessarily from the starting point of they want independence because it will involve them in building the vision for a new yeah. Scotland and that process of development will actually win support for independence long before the vote comes about. I think it's important you get all your ducks in a row before you reach independence and yeah. this, this is part of it. I was, I, I, my argument tonight is this is a central part of it. Not peripheral, not hygiene, not a box ticking exercise, front and centre. Yeah. So you can walk up to people and say, I'm sorry you feel uh, that uh, this is not a terribly good idea, but I can, I can guarantee you in this document that your rights will be safeguarded in any new state. Mm -hmm. okay. um, yes. Yes, yes I, I was just listening to Theresa May and w with absolute horror the other mm -hmm. night when she talked above her elected officials, she talked directly to the people, saying that the elected officials were causing the trouble. Now, that's exactly what is happening on a massive scale in the United States with Trump. Trump is going directly to the people with the most outrageous things. But there is a constitution there, mm. and the law 
I mean, you would think there's nothing else but lawyers just now in America, but at least they have a constitution that has some of these spelled out. But my scary thing about what I see in the States is that the Republican Party has given up its, its rights. It's not standing against the president at this point. Mm -hmm. And my fear is that the Tory party will collapse under the pressure and you will have exactly what I'm seeing in the States where you are beginning to have authoritarian government. Mm. I think it's um, hugely unlikely the Conservative Party will collapse. It has a long and um, interesting history of being able to accommodate all sorts of changes in order to ensure its continuance. And I suspect that will be the case again. I, I'm, I'm less concerned about, I mean, for me, the, the, the speech was interesting, but it was rhetorical. Uh, I, I find it an odd approach uh, uh, as a, a, a manager to insult the people you plan to try and cut a deal with. I've always found that to be unsuccessful. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm astonished that she thought that, that was a sensible way to approach things. Uh, in the end, she's going to have to cut a deal with MPs. And the way you cut deals is you try and reach some sort of understanding and compromise and con ideally consensus. What you don't do is start off by insulting the other person. Because uh, then you have a mountain to climb before you can reach the point where you want to put your point of view. I didn't actually mean that the, the Conservative Party would collapse. I thought that the Conservative Party could be taken over. The right. That, that but yeah, but it, it, it will, it will transmogrify. Yeah, you know. yeah. I mean, I mean I, my own sense is, is that the reason we were having Brexit, Brexit is because uh, it was an attempt to, uh, to avoid the breakup of the Conservative Party and it's resulted in the breakup of the country. Did we have a couple more questions before we close? Uh, Alison? Uh, back to Barry's point about the monarchy, she is Queen Elizabeth II, all for the United Kingdom. When we become independent and she retreats to being Queen Elizabeth I of Scotland, and a titular monarch where the people are sovereign, will that be the case in the new situation? I don't know. You will decide that. You, you, well, we might, you might, for all I know, for all I know and for all anyone else in this room knows, you the people are sovereign. are sovereign, but you may decide you don't want any monarchy, you want a president. You might decide that you want to have somebody called a chief waffler as, as, <laughs> as, as the arbiter. Of the, I, I have no idea. I, you or know, John Drummond. Who, who knows? Yes. I haven't for a friend. Uh, but yeah, that are there would be any more choice. questions before we go? I don't want you to leave feeling that you should have asked but didn't. Sorry to come back again. Um, you were talking about we have to, we have to, and most of us here are SNP. And therefore, in the eyes of 55% that Donnie referred to were slightly tainted. Do you have any advice about how we can really start to get this moving other than from an SNP direction? Are there any thoughts or organizations in your mind that are already there who would benefit from our encouragement, but not necessarily an SNP directed move? because that would, could bring a degree of negativity from yeah. anti-independence people, conservatives, whatever yeah, it might, might be. It's a, it's a good question. Let me be clear, I never suggested you were tainted in any way, shape or form. Well, the others would, though. The, the others Tories would, would think yeah, we were tainted, well, Lib Dems, all unionists. Let me say, but I wasn't suggesting that. Um, yeah, the, 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 the only advice I can give you was the advice that I showed you earlier. I think there's things you can do you, 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 you can make yourself knowledgeable. Uh, you can, through your various agencies. I mean, if you want me to talk to other groups, I'm happy to do that. Uh, but you might want to go for something more productive. I don't know. Uh, where uh, you're writing to newspapers. I mean, give you an example. If, if you want to do something personally. Th this is, I've left copies here of uh, the first column in the uh, Sunday National which was printed on the 10th of March, in which I say, 
everything you want to know about constitutions, but we're afraid to ask. And essentially, it's the presentation we had tonight, except it's contracted, you're believed to know, into a couple of paragraphs or so. But it does say at the end, send your questions to letters at the National. So there's lots of stuff you can do as an individual if you feel this is important to you. I don't think you should feel in any way powerless. I think you should feel powerful. And I think the way you, you feel powerful is to act powerful. It's to say, there's lots I can do. I, I don't need any help from anyone, frankly, to do that, at least of all me, because uh, there's things that I can do personally. And I would encourage you to get involved and, and do that. I wouldn't be at all surprised, by the way, if the SNP doesn't come up with some sort of uh, proposal this year sometime, because we're heading towards, I suspect, a referendum sometime soon. Well, on that positive note, first of all, can I thank you all for coming and helping make this such an interesting and stimulating evening. And thank you for, to John for stimulating us <laughs> and leaving us better informed on a fascinating subject. Thank you. Thank you. Idea is our tradition. We'll take a wee collection at the door towards our furniture fund. And if you have glasses and bottles, could you help the bar staff by leaving them on this table, please? So thank you again. Well done. I see you have not lost your pencil. <laughs>